Great. Well, I think we'll get started. Um, we just want to welcome everybody, both in person and those of you online, um, to the Delta RMT Nutrient Symposium. I don't think we've done anything like this before, but it's very exciting. And I will also just say, please bear with us. This is the first time we have tried to do a hybrid meeting with presentations in this room. So if we have a few glitches, please just, we will work through them. So just the uh, Anyway, I'm Meredith Howard. Most of you know me. I work at the Central Valley Water Board. I am the um, program manager for the, which oversees our multiple programs, our Delta program, our TMDL program. And our um, basin planning program. Hi, and I'm Debbie Webster. I'm with the Central Valley Clean Water Association, but I also serve as the uh, Delta RMP Steering Committee Co-Chair and the President of the Board of Directors. And so today, for the benefit of those that are on the online, um, just because they can look at who's on there, and unfortunately, you guys may not be able to at this point, um, we'd like to go around the room. And what I'd like to do is I'm start with Melissa and just kind of weave and then Wherever it ends up, I think uh, we'll go this way and then Tom, you can, you'll be last. Okay. Okay, well, I'll start. Melissa Turner, uh, I'm the Delta Regional Monitoring Program. And uh, welcome to the Nutrient Symposium. We're very excited for everyone to be here. Selena is trying to get the, uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. Selena. Introduction. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not great at multitasking. <laughs> the Central Valley Water Board. I'm Janice Cook um, with the Central Valley Water Board Delta Program. Tim Mott, Regional SAN, uh, part of the Delta RMP Nutrient Tank. Joe Tomabowski from US Geological Survey. Jenna Randy, CSW. Patricia Lee, Delta Purchase Council. Keith Allen Gregson with the USGS. Mark Krauss with the USGS as well. I'm with the like Roberts and Bryan Incorporated. I'm a steering committee member on our. Raji Subramani, City of Rosa, good morning. Uh, Mike Johnson, MLJ Environmental. I am a TAC, future TAC member from A. Brian Bergamoski, USGS. Dave Sun, San Francisco, West Virginia. And Oh, sure. Uh, Adam Lapis, I'm with the Central Valley Water Board. I'm Hope Taylor. I'm with Sacramento County uh, Stormwater Quality Division. I'm on the steering committee and on the board of directors. Andy Bowley, City of Acaville. Jennifer Glenn, MLJ Environmental, uh, Delta RMP Program Administrator. Ed Flynn, uh, Department of Water Resources. Gary Mitchell, Sacramento Regional Sanitation District. I'm also a board member and <laughs> Lisa Thompson, Regional SAM, Hawaii, Sacramento, District, and I'm Larry Walker, and Associate. You should tell Brian. Brian Brown, Central Valley Water Board. Well, yeah, thanks everybody. And we want to thank all the presenters and the session moderators and, in advance of their contribution to today's meeting. And I'm also going to add the committee that worked on putting this all together because it was, they did a great job and it was a lot of work. So um, for you guys that are participating in person, the bathrooms are right outside the door over here. Um, and there's pastry coffee. You can feel free to take, get up and get some. Um, during the, you know, during the presentations or during the breaks in this morning, um, we will, uh, we have, a, we will be bringing our lunch in and um, each session has an assigned moderator to it to try, who will we'll try to keep things on schedule because we do have a packed schedule. Um, we have a, a, a requested that each of the presenters allow some time for uh, question and answers. And so um, during their time slot, and then we've allocated some time at the end too for additional questions and answers. And then the way we're gonna do this is, and, and uh, Meredith will describe those that are online, but for those that are in the room, if you have a question, 
um, just please raise your hand and the moderator will call on you during that that um, period. And do you want to talk about it virtually? Yeah. So for those of you online, hello, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, the way we're going to work questions online is we're going to ask you to use the raise hand feature. Um, and then the session moderator is going to kind of alternate between questions in the room and questions online. Um, we will not be taking questions from the chat. We're not really able to disable the chat, but it's it's just too complicated and hard when we have questions. I think we're going to have enough just between the room and the raise hand feature. Um, and please put yourself on mute so we can minimize the background noise we're hearing. Um, also, for those of you participating by phone, um, it's the same protocols as all the other virtual attendees. Star nine can be used for raising and lowering hands, and star six can be used for muting and unmuting. Um, so I think with that, we'll kind of. Um, yeah, I think the next part of what we wanted to kind of talk about is mostly for the steering committee members in the room and those of you that participate in the Delta RMP. You know, one of the, the, the main impetus for this symposium was that the RMP is going to be doing some long term planning um, for our nutrients and HAVs program. And so the first thing that came up was like, well, hey, you know, we've done a lot within the RMP, but there's a lot going on in the Delta. Wouldn't it be great to have a day to like hear about all of that to help set the stage for our long-term planning. Um, so again, then okay. Debbie talked about the homework so, assignment. So for those that are steering committee, committee members, you would have gotten some homework and um, you can reach that also if you uh, online on the webpage. But we asked you to think about a couple things. And so when I talk about uh, your agency, I also want you to think about sectors because many of, of us here are represent, representative of multiple uh, people that either contribute or have interest in the in the um, RMP. So here were the questions, just so that they're in your mind as as we have the presentation today. It's what are the highest priority management and assessment question your agency or sector would like to prioritize for nutrients and hats? What are the data gaps that your agency or sector would like the RMP to pursue or fill? What are the specific monitoring or special study recommendations you heard during the nutrient symposium that your agency or sector would like to include in, in the multi-year study for nutrients and HABs? What are the topics or presentations for which your agency or sector would like additional conversation or discussion during future Delta RMP meetings? So we'll get into this a little bit later, but these are things we want you to think about, especially as you're listening this morning. Um, so is there any questions that someone has? Those are our introductory marks. So we will start the symposium. Our, our first session is called Looking Back, a review of the Delta RMP funded nutrients projects. And it's an overview of nutrient management in the Delta and an introduction to the Delta Nutrient Research Plan. And so um, we will be moderating this session and the session will kick off with a few remarks from Adam Lappitz and uh, the, he's the Assistant Executive Officer of the Central Valley Water Board. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> it's really nice to be back in person to see people and to be able to work together like this again. Um, I think that's kind of the first thing that comes out of me a little bit here today. Uh, many of you I've worked with over the years and some new faces out there, and I really look forward to getting to know you too. Um, I think it's hard to start something like this. Uh, we have a lot of really amazing scientists working in the Delta uh, on nutrients, um, and I think. You know, for for the perspective of the Central Valley Water Board, I, uh, maybe I'll look back just a little bit. Um, you know, we had the 2013 Delta Plan, the 2014 Delta Strategic Work Plan. I hope I got those titles right. Um, those contained charges for, for us, really. Those charges were to look into whether or not nutrient objectives were needed. Um, probably not the exact words, so don't hold me to those, but that's how we interpret it. Um, and so that really kicked us off on a, on a road 
uh, and started really uh, it, well continued uh, kind of a, uh, a you know some work that needed to be done uh, and we developed uh, our nutrient research plan as a stakeholder led effort or stakeholder partnership effort with our staff and, and the stakeholders um, started with Chris Bo and Janice and now Janice Chris, leading the way. Chris and Christine Job. Chris and Christine. Yeah. Okay. Um, at that time, back in 2013, 2014, the Delta RMP wasn't quite going yet. Uh, we were meeting, we were having a lot of discussions and actually kind of wrestling about funding at that time. Um, so, you know, I, I, that hasn't changed. That charge hasn't changed and that need hasn't changed. And if anything, it's become more and more urgent over the years uh, that progress be made. Um, there's, you know, we all are aware of, of the effects. <laughs> aware of, of where there are concerns and where there's not concerns uh, throughout the Delta. It's a very complex waterway, many uses. Um, and what's clear though is is that nutrient objectives are are in in there they're being worked on. Um, they're being worked on for other state waters. Um, they're very kind of front and center right now become more and more so. And I think it's a unique time for the Delta RMP. This is a, a time uh, we have a Delta RMP. Uh, we're funded. Uh, we have a nutrient research plan. We have a nutrient TAC. Uh, we are organized now, and uh, there's been a lot of change. Uh, but I believe it's a unique time and a time when we can uh, really start uh, and, and well continue this important work and develop the science necessary, develop the understanding necessary of such a complex waterway. Because uh, at the end of the day, I, I don't think that we're going to be able to answer the question with one nutrient objective built on some you know. I don't know for sure. I'm I'm an engineer, so <laughs> throw me out the door if you like. But I, I think it is it is a complex waterway. I, I I don't think that that it would be well served for us not to do the hard work, roll up our sleeves, and uh, do what we do best, and that is sign. That's our voice. That's our voice as a region. That's our voice as stakeholders into these types of processes. Um, so I would encourage, you know, each and every one of you in your agencies um, to, to kind of keep that at the forefront. We, you know, we, we this is a very important, uh, very important work that needs to be done. Um, a couple other things um, I think that that uh, I wanted to say just uh, again, thanks for being here. Thanks for being a part of this and uh, look forward to, to kind of popping in and out today and seeing the presentations. Thanks, Adam. Great. So we have our first presenter. Um, we have Tom Grovehog, who's here, and he is going to present on the Delta Nutrient Research Plan, a roadmap for nutrient research in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Thank you, Meredith. I think I'm off camera here, which is probably doing a favor to the people online. Um, <clears throat> I guess can, before you start, folks online, can you hear us? Let us know if you have any issues hearing. We have the mic in a certain spot. We can move it if we need to. So yes, Ryan, say we'll let us up. know if, if you see anything. I see, I see a thumbs up. Okay. All right. Great. Sorry. Go great. Ahead. Great. Um, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's been almost 10 years, as Adam said, since the Delta Stewardship Council charged the Central Valley Water Board to develop a study plan to set nutrient objectives in the Delta, either narrative or numeric. And they had a pretty aggressive time schedule. We haven't entirely met that schedule, but that got the ball rolling. Chris Fo and Christine Job uh, were the staff people working for the Central Valley Water Board. And they initiated a process that I, I think as you'll hear in my presentation, it's really uh, a model for how people should be addressing nutrients as they and try to answer this question. Should we set nutrient objectives? If so, what should they be? What effectiveness will they have? And that's really the, been the theme from, from the get-go. Uh, as, as Adam mentioned in 2014, uh, oh, maybe, uh, let me, um, just tell Ryan if He's you tell me when you need to go ahead. Yeah, yeah, let's go to the next one. So I yeah, okay. So next next slide, please. 
So, oh gosh, I should have used bigger font so I could see. <laughs> 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 um, so I'm going to talk today about the uh, a bit about the nutrient strategy, uh, which was the 2014 work that the board did. But then uh, also talk about the timeline of where, where it started and where we are now. Uh, and very importantly, the elements of the Delta Nutrient Science and Research Plan, or just the uh, Delta Nutrient Research Plan is kind of its current nomenclature. And then the status of implementation of that plan. So really the, the first thing that the Central Valley Board identified was the need to develop that the plan, the Delta Nutrient Research Plan. And so all the early activities in terms of gathering stakeholders, forming a, a stakeholder technical advisory group, and then developing a charter and moving forward, that it was all with kind of the vision was this plan. And certainly the Delta RMP, we are so fortunate to have all that work to have happened and to have that plan. It, it sets the table and make, should make our job easier in terms of thinking about nutrient research, monitoring, and modeling that needs to be done because it really is an organizing document as, as you'll see. And we're super fortunate that the Central Valley led us to create it. Next slide. So uh, as, as mentioned, the Delta plan in 2013 said, Central Valley Board, please, you know, tell it, start thinking about develop a plan to, to set objectives. Uh, in 2014, this is the document that, that Adam mentioned in February that said, we're going to do this. Here's our plan. Here's the, here's the problems we're going to focus on. Next slide. And those problems are, and this is one of the, one of the, I'd say the, uh, really strong attributes of the way this has been approached. It was to identify the problems that we see in the Delta. And then it was to ask and answer management questions about solving these problems. So HABs called cyanobacteria was the work group originally, but um, all things associated with uh, eutrophication. So harmful algal blooms, cyanobacteria, which is an issue with regard to the blooms themselves, toxins, but also another one of the forms of cyanobacteria that causes taste and odor problems in drinking water is also kind of under that mantle. Uh, invasive aquatic plants. We have certain plants that have invaded the delta and, and bloom in different places at di in different times of year. Uh, so that's an identified problem. Low dissolved oxygen. And then over to the right side, just the health of the delta, food web issues, you know, support of our fisheries. So that was the suite of problems that the regional board uh, started with to say, let's, let's think about, should we set nutrient water quality objectives to solve these problems? How would that work? And so that's a, it's a very complicated question and that, but let me tell you how, how it was approached. Next slide. So the first thing the board did is they uh, set up a stakeholder and technical advisory group reached out to the whole community of people affected by these problems, people in the regulated community, people in the regulatory community, and said, here's our charge. Let's, uh, let's organize ourselves to get this plan done. So the next step was to develop a charter. And that kind of put down on paper, here's our rules of engagement for how we're going to do that. Here's our, here's our game plan. And also in the charter, put down on paper, here's the problems we're trying to solve. One of the first uh, things that was identified in the charter, and this is really a smart move by Chris, was to form science work groups. So on each of those problem areas, reached out to people and said, come and work as, as members of a science work group to try to answer this management question to address this problem. And so 
pretty early in the process, those work groups were convened and they then produced white papers and those white papers and then data gaps analysis. And that was what was used by the people that ultimately put together the Delta Nutrient Research Plan. And our, we are fortunate today to have the prime author of that plan here in the front row, <laughs> Janice Cook, who kind of led the STAG and other members to develop the plan that we now have. Um, and ultimately, you know, forefront was decisions regarding nutrient water quality objectives. That is, in my mind, the management question that has been there at the start, and it's going to be there until that's the culmination of why we're doing all this work. Next, next slide. So the stakeholder technical advisory group, again, it was a very diverse group from the wastewater, drinking water, stormwater, resource management, just a, a really well-rounded group that formed the stag. And that the STAG was uh, advisors to the Central Valley Water Board staff as they went through this process that they developed. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, the charter, and I really been involved in a couple projects where we've it started with a written charter, and it really helps because when you're getting going, it, it's like let's capture what why are we doing this. But it's a, and let's talk about how we're going to do it. But to write it down and to have it as a document that, and it, so it was developed by the STAG with the Central Valley Water Board leadership as a document. It's available. Uh, we'll, I, I don't know that I have a link to it, but we have it and we can distribute it because I, I think it's, hi, Tom. It's a, uh, it's really a, was a fundamental of why this process succeeded was to have done this charter in the in the charter goals and objectives guiding principles of transparency strong science peer review uh, and focus on what are the problems we're trying to solve and and what are the questions that we have and then and then the charter actually set out a schedule so it was a it was a really great organizing document. We've used it in the Central Valley drinking water policy. We used it in the Mercury TMDL. It's it's just really, I, I would say, and it, it's a document to still pay attention to. Next next slide. And then as, as I've said in that document, should nutrient water quality objectives be established in the Delta and will nutrient load reductions remedy one or more of these identified problems. So again, that in the charter, there's there's the a very important management question that's stated right from the get go. Next slide. The science work groups, uh, they were uh, developed and we had people representation on the work groups, which were specific to each problem area from all these places, SFEI, SQUIRK, state and federal agencies, the water boards, US EPA, academia, local agencies, uh, consultants, NGOs. So not all of them was on every work group, but that's kind of the kind of representation we had on each of the work group with people attracted where they had expertise uh, to, to participate. Next. And then they developed white papers. So we ended up out of that process with five different white papers on each of the problem areas. And the, the white paper was the first step. And then it was like, okay, can you help us identify data gaps? Because that's what we need to write our plan. Next slide. Uh, key conclusions from those white papers were, for instance, the cyanobacteria and macrophytes. It's that nutrients are not limiting in the system. It's not likely that we can manage nutrients to control blooms, but we may be able to impact the duration and intensity of blooms. So that really becomes kind of one of the overarching questions that the research and monitoring needs to address. 
for modeling uh, uh, that it's in a, it was recognized early that having predictive models in this system is essential to being able to answer this question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> drinking water uh, convened the group that just identified the fact that it's different cyanobacteria that have been with us billions of years that, that cause uh, taste and odor problems that we experience in drinking water, that a lot of those impacts occur outside the Delta. So it poses an interesting question, can we control taste and odor problems in remote locations by taking action in the Delta with regard to nutrients? And then the Delta ecosystem food web issues um, the, the big takeaway from that white paper is that we need a, a holistic approach to thinking about not only nitrogen, but phosphorus as well, and that it needs to be a whole system analysis. So really some great stuff that came out of these working groups and, and the papers that they generated. Next slide. So this is just kind of showing you the flow that from the groups to the white papers, and then recommendations that were developed, which then fed into kind of the, that was the uh, guts of what uh, needed to go into the nutrient research plan. And STAG involvement was kind of consistent with these work groups and through these steps of the process, working with Chris and Christine and Janice to develop what, what we've got. Next slide. Oh, and so. Included in that was, and, and this is really a key aspect of the nutrient research plan, the connection between what are the management questions and what's the research and what's the modeling that we need to do. So if I've, I've shown this research plan to people totally outside the system and they their first comment was, wow, this is a nice thing that's been done here to connect management questions to the science that needs to be done. So really, Kudos to, to everyone uh, that, that participated. Next slide. So the timeline, uh, starting in 2014 and 2016, got organized, did the charter, formed the groups. The work groups did their work in 2017. I, the charter, I think, was July of 2015 when that was done. Um, the work group uh, activity, and then in 2018, the uh, draft and then final in July of 2018, the final uh, Delta Nutrient Research Plan. Sorry, I keep using the wrong uh, acronym there. I always call it the Science and Research Plan, but it's easier to just say research plan. Um, so the table was really set in 2018 and this went to the Central Valley Water Board. It was adopted in a resolution accepting the plan and kind of saying, hey, you guys, you said you're going to do this. You did it. Let Now let's start using it. And so be, uh, starting right after that, we've, uh, we've seen implementation of pieces of the research plan that's been happening in the Delta RMP and, and elsewhere. It may have been, and some of it may have been happening without people ever knowing what the research plan is. So, I mean, but it, it a lot of the, and, and so I think one of the points of today's symposium is to say, people really need to read this plan. It's an easy read, but it's really uh, going to be helpful for all of us to, in terms of prioritizing action and collaborating. Uh, so it's, it's just a great organizing document. Next slide. In the plan itself, uh, you'll see there's goals, a restatement of the problems to be addressed, statement of management questions, and then the three areas that the plan has kind of characterized the work to be done is monitoring, special studies, and modeling. And so there was out of the out of the white papers and and the follow up to that, we got you know and <clears throat> organized all that input into those three, three categories, and that's the way you'll see it in the plan. The STAG, members of the STAG also, once we had that, we said, okay, how do we, this is a very long list. People had a lot of good, how do we uh, prioritize that? So 
so a, a system working with the stag and the central valley board of prioritizing was worked up and, and actually was included ultimately in the plan and then also the plan talks about next steps so okay here we are we've done all this heavy lifting but where how do we get this all done and so there is a section of the plan that does talk about that next next slide uh, and the goal again is the same problem so a restatement so there's clarity uh, to conduct the research and modeling to determine whether numeric or whether water quality objectives for nutrients are needed and and then I would say and if so what should they be and the science you know so this is again it's a drumbeat really of the same theme that's been with us from the start next slide Oh, and drinking water issues was always, uh, yeah, we, we always uh, worked hard to make sure that that was also covered uh, as part of the plan. So there, if you read the plan, it identifies two primary themes that we need a deeper understanding of the multiple factors that influence the system and its response to nutrients. So that's just generally acknowledged in the plan. And secondarily, that process-based models are needed to understand the system and to test management scenarios. So that has been with us from the start. Excellent. The management questions that are laid out in, in the plan, you know, is there a problem? The answer to that's pretty easy, yes, but where does it happen when? Uh, what are the trends? You know, so let's understand the problem. That's one of the one of the things we need to do. Are nutrients contributing? If so, how? And how does the interaction of nutrients with other factors? Uh, just how does the system operate? Uh, can nutrient management help? So you'll see several of these quest these bullets are kind of going in the same direction because that one. And the last one, what management measures are needed? I mean, it all goes to we use the use of predictive tools to understand how could we manage the system, and then how will the system respond to that? And that's our goal. It's a it's a uh, <clears throat> it's a tough thing to achieve, but the work that's been done so far uh, is having this as as a question to be answered the journey of just building some of the tools that have been built already were way ahead of the game if we as it if we hadn't done that so um and so these are the questions that are contained that are all kind of sub questions to the main thing of should we be setting objective next slide i mentioned prioritization criteria these are the ones that were used so when you see the priorities that are in the plan this this is the uh, <clears throat> list of prioritization criteria. So uh, does it address a key management question? Does it fill an early information need? Is it in fact an important doing one study is important to the next several studies that might happen to help us understand the system? Uh, does it provide important input to the models that we're developing? Does it have broad application in the Delta? Will it address multiple issues? Uh, does it provide a, an opportunity for collaboration and leveraging, which has always been a big thing? Because this, this program, the one thing we haven't had a lot of is money to implement it. And that's been a big challenge. So we're by nature, and I'd say the Delta RMP is in the same boat, we're, we're not the people with the most money around the table, but if we have the, if we can be the kind of the glue or the inertia that helps leverage people that have different pots of money, that's that's always been envisioned as kind of the, the winning formula and the necessary formula to, to really fully implement the uh, the plan. And can can it be done in three to five years? We we didn't want to prioritize something that we're gonna study for the next 50. Um, next slide. So the highest priority is that if you read the plan, and this is just shorthand bullets to kind of give you a, a spoiler alert, I guess, on what's it, what's been prioritized, but HABs and toxins 
right off the bat are always been a high priority. So any discussion about, oh, why are we doing, I mean, if this plan and all the work that led to it has always told us these, this is an important thing for us to be, to be monitoring and doing special studies to answer the key questions around HABs and toxin um, and associated toxins. Model development and utilization, always a very high priority in this plan. Dealing with the ecosystem questions of phytoplankton abundance and growth and its impact on the food web, the health of the system, uh, that was ranked highly. And then the work on macrophytes, because macrophytes is a big problem in the system, impacts navigation. Uh, so anyway, so it's not a huge surprise, but those that was, if you look at the list and the prioritization of that list that's all laid out in table two of the plan um, that that this is what you'll see next next slide and then the next steps is that you know okay we've done all this we don't want this just to be a plan that sits on a shelf gathering dust somewhere let's how do we move it forward and so uh, obviously, let's start doing the high priority stuff that we've identified. Uh, let's also, uh, if we're going to ask and answer the nutrient objectives question, we need a parallel activity to go figure out what, uh, what are the potential water quality objectives if we decide that that would be a, a smart management move to set objectives, which by nature, setting objectives leads to nutrient load reduction on certain categories of sources. That's really, that's when we set objectives, that's what happens. So, uh, but really actually knowing what those thresholds might be and looking at all the research that's been done elsewhere in, in California, uh, San Francisco Bay, I, which has got its own nutrient management strategy, which looks quite a bit like what I just described for the Delta. Actually, the nutrient strategy in the Bay was a year or two ahead, but it, it has a lot of the same elements in it. So anyway, and they're, they're looking at nutrient thresholds. And when I say nutrient thresholds, what are the ambient levels of total N and total P that uh, might be set as objectives? What are those candidates? And that's, it's relatively straightforward to to do that, I mean, there's a lot of work that's been done around the country and, and in California. So, uh, but that's an, that's something we need to do because we need to ask, what, could we get to these numbers? And if we got there, what, would, it, would it solve the problem? One of our five problems. Um, and then uh, another important thing when we had, this is something that the STAG continued working on and it's kind of been impacted by COVID to be honestly we actually were starting to pull together and make some headway but as always seek collaboration and seeking funding developing a range of what if we are going to manage the system what's in our toolbox what what could we do to manage nutrients because we need that to use to match up with our predictive tools so we could evaluate the effectiveness of those measures, and then let's evaluate the thresholds that we find. So those are, again, it's uh, something that's a great starting point. Maybe it's not the final answer, but that was the thinking when the plan was done in 2018. Here's the roadmap for next steps. And, and that kind of gives a good roadmap to the Delta RMP as well, I think. Next slide. Uh, I was a little bit of, and this is very high level, but as I mentioned, we have what's been identified in the plan and the Delta RMP has actually helped fund a no number of activities that contribute to what's, so the connection to what was high priority and what has the Delta RMP done, pretty, pretty good match. And I think, you know, Great minds all think alike, so th some of these things tend to converge. But uh, the nutrient, uh, the data synthesis of there's all this data out there. Let's synthesize that. Let's at least start to understand what the system looks like. Um, have special studies. 
some of that's happening currently under work funded by the Delta RMP. The USGS high-speed cruises that have been done, which is really added to our ability to understand nutrients in the system, how they act over short time duration, and then the development of the biogeochemical model. So you're going to hear a lot more about this later today, but that's some just to make the point that a number of the things that have been highlighted in the plan is what Delta RMP has already funded. And others, I, I should say, and that's that's important. Next slide. So, I don't know. Is that time wise? Are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I've included here a couple links, and uh, to this is to the work plan, the 2014 work plan, and also the plan, the research plan itself. But as I said, and uh, I'm not, I'm not the expert in setting up links and giving them to you guys, but we can get you copy of the charter, copy of any of these white papers. They all exist. Janice sent them to me. And so we, we have them. And uh, I think anybody, it's a, it's a good read just to really get a full understanding of these issues that we're all currently dealing with. And the, the Delta Nutrient Research Plan link is in the program too. Yeah, yeah. thanks. So, questions? Yeah, so we we're going to take questions in the room. Yeah, I was going to alternate, like two yeah. one in the room and one online, depending on who we have. Is there any, is there any questions in the room to start with? Yeah. Oh, um, it was just a very basic question. Um, is Are these presentations going to be available look at after? Yes, yeah, so our plan is, um, so everyone should say we should be recording, so you should have seen the recording started online, so we'll post the recording, we'll probably split it up into a couple so you don't have to sit through breaks when you're watching it back, and then also we will PDF the slides and post them. We'll want to make sure we talk to the presenters, you guys are good, before we post the PDF version, but we'll put that online. <laughs> Okay, good. Do we? Yeah. So if you've got a question online, um, again, it's under the reactions and you can raise your hand. Um, and if you're on the phone, there's a couple people on the phone. Um, it's star nine to raise, raise your hand. Okay, we're not seeing any online. Any questions? Oh, yeah, Paul. Um, <coughs> who is using the plan besides the RMP? I think that's a um, one of the reasons for this symposium. Actually, is to get to make sure Meredith, you know, yeah, answer that. Yeah, we use the plan. Yeah. Janice actually has a lot of projects going right now that are right. not necessarily through the RMP, and so we actually really use the plan to say, well, right. you know, if we're going to do something else in the Delta, and actually, I think you're going to hear some of this from Ellen um, later. Um, so we use it. At our agency for our program, we use it all the time. We really go back to it quite a lot. And what I love about it is, you know, it's not one of those documents that's going to be outdated in five years because it really has everything, including the kitchen sink in it, which is sometimes hard to figure out. Like, gee, there are so many things that would fit into these prioritization criteria. How do we further prioritize? But it's great because it's one of those documents where it's not just going to be outdated in the future. So I feel like it's really well done. But we use it all the time. I remember sitting through some of the work group meetings and uh, reviewing documents and so forth and just you, you don't hear much about um or i haven't heard much about uh, just other other programs taking on the plan as a way to prioritize their actions so tom you had indicated that the rmp doesn't hold the lion's share of the funds that come to uh, addressing water quality issues in the Delta. So I, yeah, my, my thought is, you know, how, how does, um, how do you influence those other, um, uh, programs to use, use the plan? To, to me, I see that as a huge argument for why this symposium is being held to really start step one, people in the Delta RMP, Get this plan, use it. It we're it's a gift, really. I mean, it's truly an excellent piece of work. And I, I want to thank Janice. A number of the slides you see here today, she provided to me, but she really 
after all the work Chris did, she stepped in and really is the author of the plan. And yeah, I just think it's an excellent piece of work. So uh, she hates me to say that, but- uh, It was just taking the data caps okay, and okay, the okay, pay okay. out of the white no, papers, it's really. it's a good plan, Janice. I have to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just to that question too, um, the Delta Science Program is also a major contributor of funds and I'll be doing a talk on the day with like Lots of funds from us, and we use the Delta Mutual. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Not seeing any questions online anymore in the room. Okay. Very okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So. Our next presenter is Tim Mussen, and he is going to give us an overview of the Delta RMP studies. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, remote people. <laughs> I'm going to be a little less formal today as the podium is a bit small for me. Um, so my name is Tim Mussen. And I'm a scientist at the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District. Um, I'm also a founding member of the Delta RMP Nutrient Subcommittee, now known as the Delta, uh, the technical, the Nutrient Technical Advisory Group. And okay, you're going to need another advance to get to my first slide. Okay, and so. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to provide you with a summary of some of the findings from past nutrient projects that were supported by the Delta RMP. All the figures in my presentation were taken directly from the reports, and uh, they're all available on the program's website. So these reports were completed by the Aquatic Science Center from the San Francisco Estuary Institute and also the United States Geological Survey, and they include a summary of long-term nutrient trends in the Delta between 1975 and 2013, a update to on nutrient trends and uh, status in the Delta between 2001 and 2016, and a modeling project to identify data gaps in nutrient monitoring in the Delta, and then a chlorophyll A sensor and sample analysis inner comparison. And at the end of the talk, I'll give you just an introduction to the nutrient modeling and mapping projects that were completed uh, for the program, as we'll probably be hearing more in later presentations today. Next slide. So the first goal of the Delta RMP Nutrient Technical Advisory Group was to understand the status and trends of nutrients in the Delta. And we're fortunate here to have an amazing long-term data set on nutrient concentrations that are collected monthly by the Department of Water Resources Environmental Monitoring Program, part of the Interagency Ecological Program. And using this data, SFEI made our program's first report on the spatial, seasonal, and tempor temporal variability in nutrient concentrations. Next slide. So the report began with a conceptual model looking at all the different factors that affect nutrient concentrations in the delta. But here I'm showing the revised conceptual model from SFBI's second report. So up in the upper left corner, you can see that different sources of water will have different nutrient loads. And this can be modified by human activities and management, and they drive the overall long-term patterns of nutrients for the system. But climate variability is also very important because the water type is going to determine the water volume and dilution, the nutrient loading, and also how the water is routed through the system and where it mixes in the delta. And the water type also affects many other environmental factors. So the water, a wet water year can have higher turbidity, shorter residence times, lower temperatures, reduced clam and zooplankton grazing, less water stratification, and all of that can influence phytoplankton and bacteria growth, which in turn affects the nutrient concentration. So all of these factors interact within the tidal delta system to produce a large degree of variability in nutrient concentrations over space and time. Next slide. So looking first at water sources, we can see that the report 
modeled them for 11 locations in the Delta over a 13-year period between 2001 and 2012. And these figures show that the water source varies greatly based on the location. When you look at the top for the Sacramento River at Hood, you can see that all the water is pink, meaning it's sourced from the Sacramento River. The same is true when you look at the bottom for the San Joaquin River at uh, station C10 Vernalis, where all the water there is from the San Joaquin River. But then when you look at Disappointment Slough, um, where the water can mix, we start seeing a large diversity within the volumetric fingerprints. So when you look at the purple color for the San Joaquin River, it's dominant during the late winter and early spring period. And then Sacramento River water fills the region uh, during the spring, which was the pink color, and also during the fall. And then the east side tributaries, such as the Consumnes River and the McCullumy River, are shown in the light yellow up on the top, and they can be important sources during the winter periods. And then for this location, agricultural return water from in Delta Island is the blue source at the top, and that's present throughout the year. Then when we look in Sassoon Bay at station uh, D8 here, you can see the pink water from the Sacramento River that is moving out um, throughout the year, but during the summers, we have that red uh, brackish water coming in from the San Francisco Bay area. Okay, so the first report contained lots of line graphs of the full data set. And at the upper left, you can see that this is ranging from the mid 1970s uh, through 2013. And I've compiled all of the stations for ammonia data uh, for this period. So when you look over on the left side of the map, when, and what I have to say here is, the data ranges very greatly between the different stations. So I've added a line at 0.2 milligrams per liter, just so you can make you know, visual comparisons between these stations to see how the ammonia compares. And when we look over on the Western side of the Delta, during the winter, the ammonia concentrations come up to about that 0.2 milligram per liter uh, line. But when we look at the eastern side of the delta, it's above 0.2 milligrams per liter up in the Sacramento River at the, the top station, which is below regional sands discharge. So this is where historically we've had ammonia entering the system that you can see. And then also in the San Joaquin River, there was higher uh, ammonia concentrations. And that's where the Stockton wastewater treatment plant would have some of its influence. So to get a better look at how changes were happening both seasonally and over time, the report created these figures that were monthly averages. So the bars that you see are ranging from January on the far left to, to December on the far right, and the data set has been grouped into eras that were between 8 to 12 years period of time. So the most recent era is shown in the green bars, and the earliest era is shown in the red. And here again, I have the 0.2 milligram per liter mark uh, line for comparison between the locations. So when we look at the top at the Sacramento River at the Hood Station, you can see how early on the pink bars are, you know, a little lower than the 0.2 milligrams per liter, but then over the eras they've increased so that it was higher in the green bars up above with the most recent era that was studied. When we look in the San Joaquin River, um, the green bars are very low, right down at the bottom of the graph there throughout the entire year. But when you look back at the early eras, you can see that in the winter, on the left and right sides of the figure, the ammonia concentrations were elevated. Now down in Sassoon Bay, um, there's also a bit of an increase with the green bars higher than the red over time, and there's the very distinctive uh, lessening during the summer months. And this is where, uh, you know, biogeochemical transformations have reduced ammonia concentrations as they flowed through the system. So now let's look at nitrate concentrations. In the Sacramento River, oh, I've added a line at 0.3 milligrams per liter for comparison. So in the Sacramento River, you can see that during the winter, the nitrate concentrations are higher than during the summer in the middle of the figure, but there hasn't been a large change over the three er eras. 
The San Joaquin River at Vernalis has much higher nitrate concentrations and 95% of the total nitrogen that comes through that river is in the form of nitrate. And we do see not too much of a trend uh, over time happening here. If anything, the most recent era seems a little bit lower. And then for Sassoon Bay, you can see that in the current era, the green bars are pretty much straight across, but in the past, in the earliest era, there was this reduction in nitrate that would occur during the summer months where it dips down a bit lower. So when we look at the phosphate concentrations through the system, and here there's a line added at 0.1 milligram per liter, there isn't as much in the way of seasonal trends seen throughout most of these uh, waterways. But interestingly, the middle era was higher than the most recent era for both the Sacramento River and Sassoon Bay. And I don't have a reason for that. Um, now looking at chlorophyll A, which is a pigment that people use to measure the amount of phytoplankton that is present within collected water samples. You can see that in the Sacramento River, chlorophyll A concentrations at Hood are generally quite low. There's a little bit of an increase that happens in the late spring, but by and large, it's low concentrations. And we have a, a line here at 10 micrograms per liter. Then when we look in the San Joaquin River, during the summer period, the chlorophyll A concentrations can increase quite dramatically to above 100 micrograms per liter. And that's been happening through all three eras within this report. When we look down at Susum Bay, if you look at the green box of the most recent era, they're all very low throughout the year. But way back in the mid 70s to 80s, there used to be increases in chlorophyll from the late spring through fall that would reach up to that 10 microgram per liter um, values and might have supported increased production within the system. Well, secondary production. So some findings from this first report is that the nutrient trends are not consistent within or among stations in the Delta. So extrapolation should not be made into the unmonitored areas, such as up in the North Delta, the South Delta, or some of the Eastern tributaries. Additional studies would also be needed to evaluate the conditions and trends at these unmonitored regions. And given the large amount of variability, adding some extra monitoring stations would also increase uh, the power for determining trends over time. So that takes us to the second nutrient analysis that was run by the Aquatic Science Center in 2018. And it was both an update to the original timeline as we had more data available, but it also brought in a comparison between drought years and wet water years, and also gave us a more uh, direct look at nutrient trends over time. Okay, next. Good job. <laughs> I haven't been telling you to advance. You're doing excellent. So this figure shows an updated time series between 2012 and 2016 with Freeport Station shown on the top from the Sacramento River and Frank's Track on the bottom. And actually, that's not Freeport. That's, that's Hood. So when we look at um, what's happening in the Sacramento River, the back end of the graph has been labeled red to indicate that those were periods of drought within this analysis. And overall, both the ammonia concentrations and the phosphate concentrations were elevated in the Sacramento River. It's a little bit hard to see from this figure. And it was predominantly during the winter season that these went up. Um, chlorophyll A remained low uh, throughout the period. Looking down in Frank's track, which is from the central delta, we see that there is wider variability between the ammonia concentrations in the summer and the fall months shown by the large U gaps that come in between. And that's because there's more time for transformation to occur in the ammonia as it reaches uh, the central delta. And overall, we do see this increase in orthophosphate that was happening in the central delta. And interestingly, when we look at chlorophyll in 2016, there were blooms up to 60 micrograms per liter, which are very rare for the system. And uh, 
we really wanted to understand why that might be happening uh, following that event. Next slide. So here we're looking at two stations within the San Joaquin River. We have Buckley Cove on the top and Vernalis on the bottom. And we can see that the ammonia concentration at Buckley Cove was uh, fairly high in the first few years, and then it drops right off to really low concentration. And that's because the Stockton Wastewater Treatment Plant underwent biological nutrient removal in 2006 and helped lower those ammonia concentrations. And we see that chlorophyll A was quite low throughout that period. Um, up at Vernalis, which is upstream from Buckley Cove, we see that the ammonia concentrations were low throughout this time and that the orthophosphate increased during the drought period. And chlorophyll A um, has these summer spikes that occur that weren't necessarily more prevalent during the drought, um, but can be seen throughout the time period. All right, next slide. So here we're looking at the wet versus dry year comparisons, and we're back to those monthly averages that we saw earlier. But now there's a statistical process that's been run to separate uh, the wet year, well, significant differences in wet years and dry years. So the wetter years are colored darker, and they've received a blue color if they're significant, or on the right side of the graph, a red color if they're significant. OK, we have the same three stations that we looked at early on of the Sacramento River at Hood, the San Joaquin River at Vernalis, and at the bottom, Sassoon Bay. And we're looking across the parameters of ammonium, nitrate, phosphate, and chlorophyll A. So when we look first at the Sacramento River, we can see that the ammonia concentrations were higher during the dry years, and so were the phosphate during the summers. The San Joaquin River did not show significant differences between wet and dry years in ammonia, nitrate, or phosphate. And the, San, the Sassoon Bay also had somewhat elevated ammonium and nitrate uh, and phosphate during the drier years. Now, chlorophyll A, we'd expect to be increased during a drier water year because there's longer residence time, higher nutrient concentrations, and possibly uh, less turbidity in the system. But only Vernalis showed the increase in chlorophyll A during those dry years. Um, we actually saw the opposite in Sassoon Bay, where the wet years had higher chlorophyll A. And the report uh, propose that that might be due to a decrease in grazing pressure when there's a higher flow through that part of the system, or also it's possible that the productivity within Sassoon Bay increases when the fringing wetlands become flooded. Next slide. So now we'll look at some of the trends through 2001 to 2016. Um, so when we look at uh, the left side, we have ammonia, and we've broken the system into uh, different regions here. So on the far left is the Sacramento River, and you can see that it has the highest ammonia concentrations, and that's downstream of regional sands discharge, so that makes sense. And they were not changing during this period of time. Um, you could see them much lower at this point in time. And then the Stockton wastewater treatment plant also had uh, slightly elevated ammonia compared to the rest of the system, but it was showing the trend of decline, likely due to the plant's upgrade. Um, for nitrate, we see that it's fairly low throughout most of the stations, but it's elevated on the far right within uh, Vernalis and the San Joaquin River, and Vernalis was showing a decline during this period. All right, next slide. On the upper right, we can look at trends in phosphate. So the phosphate concentrations through much of the delta was fairly similar, but it was elevated in the San Joaquin River system. Uh, the highest concentrations were at Buckley Cove, we, but there was declining concentrations in Vernalis and increasing uh, disappointment flu. And then when we look at chlorophyll A concentrations on the right of the graph, really the only high concentrations we have are coming from the Vernalis San Joaquin River region. And near it, there was a bit of a decline occurring downstream from Vernalis. And the analysis picked up 
some increasing trends for chlorophyll A, but this was right after that 2016 bloom period. So really, while there was an increase, the starting concentration was so low that the absolute increase was fairly low. Um, and then when we look at dissolved oxygen trends, we can see they're fairly consistent throughout the waterway, but they were a bit lower um, in Buckley Cove. However, they were showing this increasing trend through this time range. And this is likely in response to the installation of aerators at the Port of Stockton in 2013, and also the biological nutrient, nutrient removal from the Stockton treatment plan in 2006. So the second nutrient synthesis report also included some summaries from other recent research within its review. And one of them was a mass balance for nitrogen that was performed by Novik et al in 2015. So when you look here, the, blow, the blue bars show the nitrogen loads that are entering into the delta and the red bars are the load that is moving on to San Francisco Bay. So the first panel shows ammonia and you can see how there's a reduction that's occurring that's fairly large. It ranged between 65 to 85%, but some of that is just ammonia transforming over into nitrate with some being utilized. Really, when we look at the far right of this figure in the total nitrogen concentration, there's a 25% decline which is occurring. And that's either nitrogen being gassed off to the atmosphere or being buried down in the sediments as it's transported through the delta. Next slide. So the report also looked within different delta subregions at uh, determining whether they were sources or sinks. We have ammonia on the left, but I'd just like to look at the total nitrogen on the right at the moment. And so what we see is that up in the north delta, there's a loss of 10% of the nitrate through the, or the total nitrogen through that region. The central had a 25% reduction and the south region had a 15% reduction. And it might be useful to do one of these types of mass balances for phosphate in the future. Uh, next slide. So since the first Delta RMP report suggested that monthly sampling might be inadequate to estimate the changes in nutrient concentrations over short time periods, the Delta RMP funded USGS to prepare three reports describing how a high frequency nutrient and biogeochemistry chemistry monitoring network could be constructed for the Delta. So these reports are available on the Delta RMP website and also within the links provided on this slide. Next. And some of the initial high frequency monitoring studies conducted by USGS found that the highest nutrient concentrations in the system were occurring during winter storms, but the timing was different for the peak concentrations throughout the system. The, nit the nitrate concentrations could change rapidly during semi-diurnal tides and available sunlight that there was substantial within month variation within the chlorophyll A concentrations at most locations that were monitored, and that some locations in the northern delta had lower DO than what would be expected due to seasonal changes, indicating that the DO might be depressed because of higher increased residence period. And they also um, really put forward that the high frequency monitors are beneficial because they allow for the measuring of the flux of nutrients through the system, both the evective and dispersive. And really within their studies at the cash SLU, if you only looked at evective flux, you'd be missing 30% of the total flux that was occurring. Next slide. So the second nutrient synthesis report concluded that there were some large major gaps in our understanding of nutrients. And the first one was, uh, we don't really understand how the Delta ecosystem is affected by these nutrient concentrations. And the second was that the primary sinks, sources and processes in the Delta still need to be resolved for us to understand how the nutrients are changing. Uh, the report recommended that in the future, we should use mechanistic water quality hydrodynamic models to define the important processes, time scales, and spatial scales, and that augmenting monitoring programs with additional parameters, stations, and sampling events would inform data gaps. And finally, that short term intensive monitoring and special studies should be conducted to test nutrient management actions and elucidate 
the mechanisms and parameterization. Okay, while the second nutrient synthesis report was being written, the Delta RMP also funded a study that modeled the water sources to different regions of the Delta and looked at the hydraulic residence time. So resource management associates was subcontracted to use the Delta simulation model 2, DSM2, to create volumetric fingerprints and understand the proportion of water supplied to different tributaries in eight different subregions of the Delta over time. In the figure on the left, you can see that there were water sources were varied pretty greatly amongst the different subregions and also over the seasons. And I'm not gonna focus on this too heavily at this point in time, but I will say one of the other interesting findings was that this north central uh, subregion, which was right there in the middle of the Delta, really didn't appear to be a uniform water body mass. And so they recommended that it be split over into the East Delta and to the San Joaquin River in future monitoring analyses um, to follow the, the sources of the water. And that can be seen on the, the red bars to the right. And when it came time for the pesticide TAC to do their comparative studies through the Delta and the subregions, um, we use this refined uh, set of subregions for that analysis. When we look at the water ages that were identified during the monitoring, they released particles at the different sources and tracked them for 28 days under low average and high flows to look at how the water was moving through the system. And the blue color in these maps is corresponding to five or less days, and the green color is between 12 and nine days. And this was in September of uh, 2010. So looking at a summary of the, the water age, we can see that overall there was a lot of variation amongst the different subregions. And subregions in the Sacramento River flow path usually had a short transit time. So on the figure to the far left, you can see the red dots that correspond to five or less days are going right down the Sacramento River flow path out uh, to San Francisco, but up to the north in Liberty Island, we're greater than 28 days of residence time in that region in general. And down in the south, there's also a fairly high uh, residence time between 10 and 20, 15 days. The interesting thing is as we move up to an average flow or a high flow through the system, all of the system started draining in that zero to five day period shown by red dots throughout all the sub basins. <laughs> Another analysis that came from this report was to predict where it would be most beneficial to include future Delta uh, monitoring locations. So there were two recommendations up in the North Delta near Liberty Island. There were two in the East Delta, one above and one below the uh, Delta cross channel because the water sources differed fairly greatly between those two regions, and then one in the South Bay. And when you look on the right side of the map, what you can see is areas with fairly high residence time that were recommended for high frequency water quality mapping projects because these areas might be uh, locations where nutrient transformation would be occurring. So the next study was performed in 2018, and this was the chlorophyll A intercomparison study. So the Delta RMP funded, uh, provided funding for this intercomparison to try to improve the accuracy, precision, and overall comparability of chlorophyll A analyses conducted within the Delta. So sensor comparisons involve side-by-side -side deployments of uh, water fluorescent songs at Mossdale and Liberty Island. And then split samples were collected uh, from Grizzly Island and Lisbon Weir and sent to 12 laboratories for analysis uh, to, for their discrete studies. And when we look at the side-by-side -side chlorophyll A sensor deployment, you can see that there was variation in total chlorophyll A concentrations between the different sensors, which are shown on the left uh, as the different colored lines and on the right as the individual um, boxes. And overall, while the sensors were different, the relative changes over time tracked quite similarly. And further analysis showed that the older YSI-6 models 
we're providing lower chlorophyll A concentrations than the newer XO2 models. So the recommendation was made that Delta agencies should start up a experimental long-term station where they can put multiple uh, chlorophyll A fluorescent centers and have them deployed in the Delta so that this can be tracked over time and increase their comparability. When we looked at the laboratory chlorophyll A in our comparison, it also found some interesting results. So first off, samples from two agencies ended up being removed from the analysis, one due to a lack of repeatability, and the other had particularly high chlorophyll A concentrations that didn't match the rest of the set. So when we looked at the other 10 laboratories and what factors might have been uh, affecting chlorophyll A concentrations, there was no response between the differing filter pore sizes, uh, whether or not the filters were ground before analysis, uh, fluorometric versus spectrophotometric analysis styles, or any of the hold times that were less than 24 hours. There is a recommendation that any bottle that is being stored uh, really needs to be homogenized or, you know, gently mixed before you filter it. And also, future studies should really be conducted using single algal, algal cultures testing standardized serial dilutions to really look into what would be driving the variation between chlorophyll A analyses. So the next two projects that the Delta RMP funded were focused on nutrient modeling and nutrient mapping. And what we uh, see over on the left is where the Delta RMP supported SFEI in developing a 3D process-based spatially explicit nutrient model for the delta that was externally coupled to a hydrodynamic model. And the model output for nitrate can be seen as the blue line uh, in these figures. And overlaid on that is the monthly sampling from the DWR's environmental monitoring program, uh, shown as purple dots. And so, uh, when we get to the mapping here, the, the RMP supported USGS to go out and conduct high resolution boat mapping cruises that could measure nutrient concentrations throughout the Delta at many locations that had never previously been monitored. And on the right, you can see the output of the SFEI biogeochemical model shown as the different shades of color for nitrate in the background with the mapping cruises findings for nitrate during the same period of time overlaid within the colored rings. And you can see how they match up quite closely here through the system. So there was a large amount of collaboration between these agencies as these reports were generated that was really appreciated by uh, the nutrient subgroup. And I'm not going to review the findings from either of these projects further because we have the primary authors from both of these studies with us today. And I believe that they're going to go into their background findings as well as their future recommendations for uh, modeling and mapping in the system uh, later today. So I want to leave you with two important considerations that were highlighted by the findings of these early Delta RMP report. The first is that the Delta RMP is going to require a continued understanding of the nutrient status and trends as we go forward to evaluate the potential environmental effects that are specified in the Delta Nutrient Research Plan. And the second is that biogeochemical modeling and high frequency monitoring are likely needed to explain and predict the rapid changes in nutrient concentrations that occur within the delta. And I'll add to that, special studies are needed to inform uh, these modeling exercises as well when the data is not available. So that's what I have for you today. Uh, thank you all for your attention. We have a few minutes for questions. I'll look to the room first. Does anyone in the room have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll stand up. Um, did we talk about your, your mass balance? I talked about Emily Novick and SFEI's mass okay. balance. <laughs> <laughs> I stand correct. The, the, the conclusion was that there was like 30% that sort of unaccounted for that could either have been 
Barry, or I mean, did I did I misunderstand? Right. Janice is going no, no, no. So what no, so case? so and and Dave's here and Janet. Anyone can feel free to correct me, but from what I understood from the report, when we look at the total nitrogen concentration that's entering the the delta and then leaving, um, there is a 25% decline that's coming through, and that means that those that amount of nitrogen has been removed during transport. And, and one of those ways is nitrification can turn it into nitrogen gas. So it goes off to the atmosphere. Another potential source is that it is collected by the plants and then buried and deposited within uh, the sediment at a faster rate than the sediments releasing nutrients. Um, and going further than that, I will allow others to so jump my question in. Was be any chance that I was thinking about it getting incorporated in a biomass and into mm -hmm. clams and that sort of thing in the, in, in the bed Yeah, I, I think that the idea is that sort of the idea buried in the sediment is not necessarily that the, the water dissolved nutrients is being attracted, but it's being sequestered within the animals and plants as it moves through. And then those are, you know, retained within the delta. Am I right in that one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, at some point in time, would you expect to sort of the flux back into the, or would you just stay buried? Otherwise, it's a whole lot of clams at the bottom. Yeah, I would say some, at right. some point, there's got to be some sort of. So I assume, I, I just guess. Well, and, and the different conditions are going to affect how much of that's happening, right? So in some ways, they're trying to build the wetlands that will slowly accrete and build up biomass to raise the elevations of the sided islands. In other areas, you might have massive erosion that's pulling the sediment back out and releasing nutrients. Um, it's interesting when you look at a tidal wetland system, whether it is, you know, taking on nutrients during times or whether it ends up releasing it from some of the material that is grown terrestrially and then transported to the system. Okay. I'm sort of thinking about potential studies, but flux is staying in things. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Sorry, Jimmy. So I'll, I'll just say it was a mass balance. So it was what's coming in, what's going out, there's a 30% difference. So another way to, to flip that is well, 70% of the of the nitrogen is leaving. Um, and that's based largely on monthly measurements taken at the environmental monitoring program station. So we don't have all of the measures in there. And it doesn't, wasn't designed to evaluate how much is cycling and recycling and cycling in the delta at the same time. It just, there's a lot of nitrogen leaving the delta. And, and Tim mentioned, okay, we also need a phosphorus mass balance. Folks in our office have worked on that too. I believe it was also a June to October period in that mass balance. So it um, also was not intended to capture the big, okay. the high flows. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's it really yeah. what's happening in the growing season. And there's still a lot of nitrogen leaving. Thank you, Jane. Um, does anyone online have questions? Please use raise hand feature. If you're on the phone, I believe it's star nine. We're not seeing anyone <laughs> raise hands, so. Okay. Go ahead, Debbie. I have another question just following up. So we talk about model. Are we, and I think you had said during the presentation that, um, you know, it doesn't, these fluxes, right? So we've got other factors that we're trying to look at. Do we look at things like atmosphere? Is there any way to, to basically do a cross media estimate? Is there data that, can, that gets put in the model or is that just, it's just assumed a closed system other than what's happening in the water body itself. Um, that's really a question for <laughs> Dave and Shen Lin, and I think they'll get to it in their modeling <laughs> presentation. I would say yes. I was going to say that there's both direct atmospheric deposition and then there's deposition that happens in surrounding lands that can be brought in with precipitation events and runoff. So again, when it comes to how the models account for that, I'll let okay. the uh, authors speak to that end. Good. It's a cycle. <laughs> right. Okay. Are there any questions online? Uh, does she mean yeah. uh, ask me three? Three. I'm sorry. I'm butchering your name. I'm sorry. 
um, Vasini S, if you're uh, on, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, uh, Vamsi Sridharan from uh, Tetra Tech. I was with National Marine Fisheries Service until very recently and University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, great talk. Uh, so the question that I have is, uh, are there any additional modeling projects planned delta wide uh, that deal with this issue of uh, nutrient balances? Uh, and if so, um, are there potentially um, opportunities for uh, proposals for such modeling projects? I, I just like like a high level programmatic uh, take on this. Well, I can respond that I'll, I'll let some of the modelers inform you as to the progress being made in those areas. But as for the funding sources, this is one of the topics that is important to the Delta RMP, and we're currently going through our process of looking at where to allocate our funding over the next five year period or so. So it's certainly if it's something important, um, you know, bring to attention uh, why you think it is an important cause for our steering committee members to consider as we move through that process. Um, I'll just add, we do have a nutrient modeling session after lunch, so. I'll say you could maybe ask a question again once you've heard their talks. Thank you. With questions, um, Selena wrote in the chat, if anyone else is not able to raise their hand. So if you're not able to raise your hand or that feature's not working, just put something in the chat saying you, you have a question. Anybody else in the room? I, I, I was wondering if there are, um, sensors for parameters other than chlorophyll yeah. and is that in that and then the question <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 yeah there are so so i would say that the chlorophyll is probably the most longest running sensor for looking at it you know phytoplankton concentrations, and it's the most widely dispersed we have through the Delta. And it was probably one of the only ones used at the time of those early reports. They, they had moved on a little bit of, uh, were, were the phycophinin sensors also available back then? I mean, overall, when you're looking at different species, that's a newer sensor. USGS has started deploying them throughout various parts of the system, and other agencies might as well. Um, that are looking at different pigment wavelengths to determine what type of species might be present through the system. Um, but the overall biomass chlorophyll A uh, is retained within all of the different species and is a useful quick method for comparing um, the, the biomass and quantity of phytoplankton in general over time. So yeah, we're moving. The, the sensors are advancing constantly, and we do have organizations testing the newer sensors through the system. So that would be chlorophyll sensors, but what about uh, for chemical? Oh, yes. Yeah, so all of them are matched to water quality sensors. And you know, Tamara and Brian can give you a more complete list well, than I will, but. Uh, uh, I think you're asking why was there a uh, chlorophyll an in situ uh, chlorophyll sensor report comparing sensors across agencies and not other sensors. And I think uh, hopefully we assume that across agencies, it's they're doing a good job of intercalibrating temperature, um, conductivity, turbidity, because there's a lot of standard methods and there's standards for that. So it, it's uh, so. So the assumption is that we can compare temperature data across all the different agencies, even if they have different sensors out there. But the chlorophyll intercalibration um, study was done because uh, chlorophyll sensors are known to sort of have, there, there's, it's not that straightforward to uh, calibrate them and um, different sensors uh, because of the way they're designed might be measuring um, chlorophyll abundance differently. So that was the impetus for that. And then also the analysis of chlorophyll is known to have some issues and it was recognized that there are lots of different labs that are analyzing for chlorophyll concentration. So there was the impetus to do that study to try and understand how 
how good are we doing as a community in collecting comparable data for chlorophyll specific? Thanks, John. With that, I'm gonna I'm gonna just wrap us up because <laughs> okay. we're we're due for about a 10 minute break, which we'll now make an eight minute break to stay on the schedule. So we will break until 10 o'clock.